Uh, does it say that it's broadcasting? Mm -hmm. Great. All right. I'll let everyone in here. Uh, good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Donnie Passo. I am a rabbi at Harvard Hillel and also a Harvard University chaplain. This is the first in a series of events that we are hosting uh, with experts uh, in uh, regarding questions as their expertise relates to uh, the coronavirus. And tonight we are beginning uh, with uh, two noted scholars and uh, public intellectuals, Rabbi Shai Held and Professor Michael Sandel. Uh, this evening will be moderated by my colleague, Jamie Drucker. Uh, stay tuned for more sessions that we'll be hosting in the coming weeks. In particular, uh, this coming Monday at 7 p.m., Noah Feldman will be hosting a session on Passover during a time of uh, coronavirus. Uh, professor Michael Sandel is the Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of Government at Harvard University. He is the author of numerous books, including what Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets and Justice, What's the Right Thing to Do. His course, Justice, was one of the most popular courses ever taught at Harvard with something like 1,000 students, and it was made freely available online and on television. Uh, Michael, I actually first encountered your course when I was traveling in Prague, and I was staying in an apartment there with a travel buddy who had a major snoring problem. So I actually moved out of the room which we were in. I set myself up in the hallway on the uh, on the floor there, but I still could hear him snoring and I was up late nights and I found your course and began to watch there. So thank you for keeping me company during that time. Uh, we also have with us Rabbi Shai Held. Uh, Shai is a dear friend and important uh, teacher of mine, a cherished teacher. He is president, dean and chair in Jewish thought at Hadar, a traditional egalitarian yeshiva in New York City where he also directs the Center for Jewish Leadership and Ideas. Shai has a long background at Harvard. Uh, he graduated from Harvard College, also received his PhD from Harvard, and uh, worked at Harvard Hillel as well. He is the author of Abraham Joshua Heschel, The Call of Transcendence, and The Heart of Torah. Uh, while precautionarily uh, quarantining myself in Philadelphia, unable to see my mother, I actually read on Shabbat some of the excerpts from Shai's book to her uh, while she was standing on her balcony. So Shai, I appreciate that. Uh, Shai has also been very open about some chronic pain with which he suffers. Uh, and Shai, you are an incredible teacher and uh, theologian. And the fact you're able to do so with such grace when it's not always easy uh, is something that we are all very, very grateful for. So thank you. And moderating uh, our panel is Jamie Drucker, uh, my dear colleague, who is the Student Activities Director at Harvard Hillel. She's also a proctor in Canada. In both of these roles, she is a beloved mentor and teacher to hundreds of students, especially during a difficult time that we're dealing with right now. Uh, Jamie also completed a Master of Divinity last year at Harvard Divinity School. And Shai, uh, the title of your book is The Heart of Torah. I would say that would be an apt description of Jamie as well. Uh, so I'm going to recede into the background and hand it over to Jamie. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Donnie. Professor Sandel, Rabbi Held, it is an honor to get to share this Zoom screen with both of you. Uh, to begin, I noticed that there are some common descriptions, commonly heartbreaking descriptions, and some of the things that both of you have been writing of late. Rabbi Held, you said that this is an ethical train wreck. And Professor Sandel, you said that this is a time where we were morally unprepared for this pandemic. To begin, I'd ask both of you just to say a bit more about what you mean by each of those things, and also to describe some of the biggest moral and ethical questions that are raised by coronavirus and how you're beginning to think about them. Michael, go do you ahead, want to go first? Shai. Go ahead, Shai. I should go first. Um, well, thank you all. Um, I, I, I guess I should just take a minute to say, um, as Donnie already alluded, Harvard Hillel, has a very special place in my heart. It is the first place I ever taught a class in Jewish studies as an undergrad. I had the privilege of serving as a student president. And then um, 
working for three years as a rabbi under a cherished mentor of mine, Bernie Steinberg. Um, and it is really a, um, a great privilege to do anything I can for and with Harvard Hillel. Um, so I wrote about an ethical train wreck in a particular context, and maybe I'll start there. I was responding very early on to a series of comments I had either overheard in person or read where young people were cavalierly dismissive about the lives of the elderly. You know, people would say to me that they, they, they were overhearing people saying things like, well, it's only people who are over 80 who are gonna die, why is that my problem? Um, and bracket for a minute the, the sort of obscenity of that kind of sentiment and what it says about a society when the elderly are treated as essentially worthless. But more fundamentally, I mean, actually you could say a lot about that, but more fundamentally even, one of the things that it brought home to me is that one of the things that make, makes us so woefully unprepared as a society for dealing with a situation like this is how attenuated our sense of social solidarity really is. The impulse to say, oh, well, it's not about me, so it's their problem. And I think that that is a massive social crisis. The problem is you can't fix that in the moment. That's all about the, um, the moral preparations that take place in advance. It reminds me in a funny way of what Iris Murdoch used to say about morality, that a lot of male philosophers imagine that morality took place in big moments. I have a big ethical decision before me and I make it. But actually, much of the work of the moral life takes place actually in between moments like that, in the building of relationships and the, sh the shaping of what she called attention, right? Noticing what's around me, being awake and attentive to other people's needs. And that's where the real work um, has to take place. So that's on one level, when I talk about a moral train wreck, I think it's about disregard for the elderly in particular, but also again, a sense of weakened social bonds um, um, more generally. I was reminded the other day somehow of a sentence I read after the Clinton impeachment where a Christian theologian, I no longer remember where I read this, commented, the problem with the common good is that it is neither common enough nor good enough. Um, and I, I find that to be like a really astute statement in many ways about American society. Um, and I think that's, that's part of, of what I had in mind when I talked about an ethical train wreck. I mean, I'd be happy to elaborate on any of this as we go, but you know, th that's where I would start. Um, I guess I just want to add one other piece to this, which is about the elderly in particular. And that is that I think we are really reaping the fruits of what happens when a society begins to define people's worth as about productivity. Well, what happens if you measure people based on productivity is that people who are no longer productive or no longer as productive essentially come to be seen as worthless. And what a theological critique, I'm not sure it has to be theological, but it certainly can be, what a theological critique of that insists upon is that human beings are infinitely valuable and carry inestimable worth simply by dint of being human. It is not about productivity. That's not how we measure the value of a human life. And I, I guess I just find myself wondering whether the, the disdain that I heard expressed for the elderly was in part just about the ugly fruit of a very perverse way of seeing what human value is, where everything is market driven and everything is about um, productivity as a kind of God. Now, since you asked about the ethical dilemmas um, as I see them, I guess I, I, I just want to conclude with two quick thoughts. One is one of the questions I have, and I'd really be interested in Michael's take on this as a political theorist, is the kind of pause that we are taking as a society right now is so unusual and in many ways so unprecedented that I wonder what it would take for us to use this pause as a way of really reconsidering some of what we've lost as a society. What would a commitment to the common good look like? How would we instill a robust sense of social solidarity in children and young adults? And for that matter, restore it among adults in our completely fractured country. Um, on a very um, concrete level, which I don't claim any expertise in, I think we are also really just now at the beginning of facing questions in medical ethics that are simply overwhelming 
about triage and ventilators, about all kinds of incredibly difficult questions. And as a footnote to that, I will add, we will one of the many things we will have to deal with, I think, in the wake of this crisis, is you know what philosophers and psychologists have taken to to calling moral injury on the part of medical professionals being faced with making decisions that they didn't sign up for that are antithetical to what they understand their life commitments to be, which is about saving life, not deciding who lives and who dies. There is a lot coming down the pike that we are not really very prepared for. I'll leave it at that as an opening. I find what, uh, Shai, what you've said, um, I, uh, I think it's very powerful. And I, I'd like to pick up on the points you raised about solidarity and the frayed social bonds that the pandemic has revealed. I think it's worth noticing that moments of great crisis like this one don't suddenly present us with new human and ethical dilemmas. What they do is they cast in sharp and dramatic relief the, the ethical dilemmas that already are implicit in the lives we live. And uh, Rabbi Held mentioned the, the division between the young and the old that, uh, that he, found, he heard expressed in alarming ways. Now, the pandemic did not invent that lack of connection between the generations. It cast in sharp relief a kind of division that we've already been living with, if not necessarily confronting directly. There's another division that in a similar way has been cast in sharp relief by the pandemic. And you can think about it when, when you ask what, um, what are the patterns of work that we now experience in the face of this pandemic. And we, we see a sharp divide between those of us who can, though sequestered in our homes, more or less go about the work we do, teaching online, writing, communicating, discussing. We can do that work from the relative safety of our homes but there are a great many people in our society who can't work remotely. The work they do connects them, requires that they be projected into the physical world, often now a world of considerable risk. And so the division between those of us who do works of writing and thinking and teaching and analyzing can pretty much go on undisturbed once we become accustomed to technologies like Zoom. But the people who are working in grocery stores as cashiers, they're exposing themselves to risks every day so that the rest of us can get groceries. And think of those delivery workers on whom we increasingly rely, especially those who are, who are part of the gig economy, whose work is irregular. Making a living for them depends on taking risks every day, collecting food, distributing food, making deliveries. And so I think one of the ways in which we were morally unprepared for this crisis is just as Rabbi Held has said, we, we've been experiencing for some time, for some time the fraying of social bonds and of solidarity. And we see this even in the, the policy response to the crisis. Uh, one, one suggestion I made is that just for, for the next 18 months, why don't we do an experiment since we hear all the time from politicians and now even advertisers, we hear a slogan 
we are all in this together. You've heard that? Almost everywhere you look on television or listening to politicians, we hear the, the slogan of solidarity. We are all in this together, but it rings hollow because we know it's not really true. It's a solidarity of fear that we have in, invoked, but it's not the kind of solidarity that involves shared sacrifice and the mutual obligation of citizens for one another. So here would be an experiment to give concrete meaning to the proclamation that we're all in it together. Why don't we say for 18 months, we will extend free universal health care to everyone. After that, we can debate whether to continue it or not. For 18 months, let's ensure that all workers have paid sick leave just for 18 months. See how it works. Get us through the crisis, perhaps. Uh, but then maybe, maybe that will create uh, practices of solidarity that, we'll, that, that we will find our habit forming, and we can have a political debate about whether to continue those kinds of shared, uh, shared commitments to one another once the crisis, once the virus recedes. But I think that what we share, Shai, is, is a, a worry about solidarity and, and the social bonds that hold communities together. Uh, and that we're morally prepared precisely because in recent decades, those bonds have become unraveled. Thank you both. We all have this special privilege of having these two minds uh, in conversation with one another. So I invite you each, what would be a burning question you'd like to ask of your partner on this panel? Well, I have a question, Shai, for you. I read a very interesting commentary, a kind of sermon that you recently wrote in Forward. And you connected this moment to Pesach, which is coming up. And you spoke about the current plague that we are experiencing, the COVID plague, I suppose we could call it, and the plagues that God brought upon Pharaoh. And what strikes me in thinking about the similarities and the differences between our plague and the ones visited upon Pharaoh and the Egyptians is when we read the Haggadah, we assume that the plagues were justly inflicted by God. When we look at the plague we are living through now, the COVID plague, we take it more or less for granted that it has nothing to do with divine retribution for sin. It's just a natural event unconnected to any divine judgment. Uh, so here's a question, Shai, that occurred to me uh, reading this very rich commentary that you wrote. Do you think we can do all together without the idea that plagues, when they occur, natural disasters, pandemics, earthquakes, floods, is it possible altogether to reject the possibility that this has anything to do with a judgment on the way we live? What would you say? I appreciate the easy question. <laughs> um, well, let me actually just, just begin a response um, by saying a couple sentences about the essay to which you allude and then back into an answer. Um, what I argued as Professor Sandel just suggested is that um, there is obviously, uh, there's not even an argument, I think it's sort of obvious, a very dramatic gap between the story we tell in which 
the plagues, however brutal and frightening they are, also make a certain kind of moral sense. And they take place within a universe in which the cosmic order and the moral order are in sync with one another. Right. And in contrast, where we live now is in a world in which it's almost taken for granted that the natural order, the cosmic order, if you will, and the moral order are in many ways, you know, running on on totally separate tracks. Right. And My question, Shai, just to press you is, do you think that assumption needs to be reconsidered? Do we need to reflect on that now easy assumption? Right. So he, here's what I am inclined to say about your your question about can we live without it. So to to offer a sketch that is too simple, and there are several Bible scholars I see on this call, so I'm especially conscious of the fact that I'm going to oversimplify now. But I'm going to say that in the Bible, there are two models of thinking about how a plague might come about. I'm going to call them the Deuteronomic model and the wisdom model. The Deuteronomic model is, look, if you do X, I will be irritated and I will bring Y upon you. You know, if you chase other gods, if you oppress the widow and the orphan, then I, God, will intervene and you will pay a very hefty price. Right. And that's the Deuteronomic model. The wisdom model is, look, when you behave in certain ways, you unleash something in the world and it will come back to you. Um, you could even say that the wisdom model has something in common with karmic pictures of the world. I mean, and they're not overlapping, but they have something in common. I guess what I would be inclined to say philosophically, theologically is, I think there is room in the world for maintaining some version of a wisdom model about some plagues that we face. For example, the climate crisis we face is we face is not totally separable from decisions human beings have made and continue to make. Um, you know, the unleashing of hurricanes, um, we are susceptible to them and susceptible to their damage in part because of decisions that we have made. Um, that I think is a wisdom model. Um, it doesn't imply divine intervention so much as divine design of how the world works. Now, to be clear, that does not include every plague we face. I have no idea what to say in that regard about the coronavirus and don't really want to, right? I'm much more interested, as I said in that forward piece, in religion being about how we respond in the face of immense suffering than in explaining people's suffering, which often ends up being about explaining other people's suffering and thereby justifying it, which is not a business I wanna be in as a human being, let alone as a theologian. Um, so I, I guess what I'm saying is I agree to the Deuteronomic model. We don't live in that world anymore. Um, whether you think that's an ontological change, God used to work that way, but does no longer, whether it's a phenomenological change, the way we've understood the world, we, we, you know, that's a discussion for an intellectual history um, context. But I think there is some place um, for a wisdom discourse that really takes seriously the fact that some of the choices, many of the choices we make as human civilization come back to us. And here's where I think that conversation really is related to what we've been talking about, about social bonds. Because the decisions I make do not necessarily come back to haunt me, but they may haunt somebody else living half a world away, or they may haunt my great grandchildren who I will not meet. And that wisdom model on some level reminds us that whether we like it or not, whether de we deny it or not, there is a kind of interconnection of human life and for that matter of created life altogether that we can deny but not actually avoid. Um, and that I think is very powerful. In other words, I think simply the more we understand about how decisions we make affect people all around the world, the deeper should be our commitment to a sense of social and even global solidarity. Now, that's a very tall order, obviously, but that's what I think we need. I mean, if we're going to ever respond to the climate change crisis, it's going to be about a really profound sense of being interconnected with people we have been trained to simply ignore, see as, you know, not really registering on our, on our screen. Um, Jamie, am I allowed to ask Professor Sandell a question now? Happily, please do. So I guess, Michael, what I what I would be interested in hearing you reflect on a little bit is the question of how we get there. I mean, your suggestion about the 18 months of, of um, universal health care um, 
and you know, a, a recommitment to a deep, deep social safety net um, and an honoring of people who really keep our society going in all kinds of ways, who are, you know, the, the unsung heroes who all of us are, or many of us at least are singing now, right? But how do we get there? I mean, Donald Trump is the president of the United States, right? The Republican Party has been committed to weakening the safety net in all kinds of ways throughout its term. And I guess I want to know, how do we get to Michael Sandel's great social experiment? Meaning, what steps can we take living in the America that we presently live in to move us closer to that as more than, you know, an aspirational ideal for those of us on this call, let's say, and as something of a reality so that when we emerge from this, maybe we emerge into a reality that we've changed at least somewhat. I think it's important to begin uh, by uh, accepting if, if what you and I have been suggesting is right, the, the moral challenges we face having to do with community and solidarity and sense of responsibility for one another did not begin with Donald Trump. And I think part of what, uh, part of what impoverishes our moral and public discourse is that we're so riveted in our attention to, uh, to the outrageous statements and behavior of Donald Trump that we forget that the way for the predicament we've been describing was prepared long before he came on the scene. Uh, it seems to me that the moral content of our public discourse has been diminished and impoverished uh, over the period of the last several decades. And that responsibility for the hollowing out of public discourse includes Democrats and Republicans alike liberals and conservatives alike. All of those who broadly agreed on the project that has unfolded over the past four decades of a kind of market-driven, some would call it neoliberal version of globalization, uh, faith in markets um, that, uh, that assumes that market mechanisms are the primary instruments for achieving the public good. Now, in some ways people say, well, that sounds like what Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher brought to bear in the early eighties. And that's certainly true. They, they defended a reliance on markets uh, and they were critics of government. But even after they passed from the political scene, the mainstream center left political figures who replaced them Bill Clinton in the United States, Tony Blair in Britain, Gerhard Schroeder in Germany. They, ex they didn't challenge the basic premise that markets are the primary instruments for achieving the public good. They moderated and to some extent um, uh, removed some of the harsh edges of a pure market. Uh, approach to the public good, but they didn't articulate a broader moral or civic project or set of ideals. So we've never really had a debate on the underlying premise, the market faith. And as a result, public discourse has become either narrow, managerial and technocratic, which really outsources moral judgment to markets and experts and technocrats without allowing for democratic public uh, debate. Or when passion does enter, what we have are shouting matches, partisan shouting matches, ideological food fights on the floors of Congress or on talk radio or on cable television. So I think a broad swath of our political class has been implicated in the hollowing out of public discourse. And, and I think the first step, even before we get to policies 
uh, to do with uh, health care or sick leave uh, or support for working people or a greater measure of solidarity, we have to recast the terms of public discourse to address more directly than we are accustomed to doing the broad moral questions about the common good that we've begun to discuss uh, this evening. And one of those questions, which be, is a kind of link to these policy debates, is what do we owe one another as citizens? What is the meaning of the common good if the common good is not simply defined as maximizing GDP? And, and so that's how, that's how I would begin. And uh, one, just to take one very concrete illustration connected to the response, the policy response to, to the current crisis. Very interesting. It's true that Congress passed and President Trump signed a $2 trillion stimulus or bailout package. And it sends $1,200 to uh, most uh, citizens, most working people under a certain income level. And it extends unemployment benefits for a period of time. But it, what, what it doesn't do is protect work. What they've done in Britain and in the Netherlands and in Denmark is instead of focusing on unemployment insurance, they've focused on seeing to it that people keep their jobs. The governments in these countries have essentially said to companies, we will pay, we the federal government will be the employer of last resort. We will pay the wage bills of your workers, 75 to 90%, provided you don't lay them off. Which means, unlike our system, when the crisis recedes and people are able to go back to work, they will still have their jobs rather than have to scramble to seek new jobs and to, to apply for unemployment benefits. This, I think, we can't even begin to discuss alternatives like this without a broader, morally robust discussion about the meaning of the common good. Thank you. Thank you both for your responses. As we begin to build ideas of what a common good we could be working towards look like, um, I'm noticing in, in your question about plagues being justly inflicted and your response, Rob, I held uh, is this concept of merit. Uh, I, you have both also discussed elsewhere that it seems that some people hold the belief that there are people who deserve a particular fate. You mentioned this a bit in your, um, your description of the wisdom model, Rabbi Held. So how, given these competing considerations, would people be able to begin to make these difficult decisions around who is deserving of resources like ventilators, but also who is deserving of our sympathy? Is that to me? It's to both of you. Well, I'll, I'll let Michael go first and then I'm happy to. <laughs> okay. okay. No, oh, I mean, no, I'm, I'm either way. Well, the, the, the question about merit and desert, I think has run through uh, uh, just not, not far beneath the surface of the conversation that we've begun to have. Um, because the, uh, in fact, I, I, I just finished a new book that is called The Tyranny of Merit that, uh, and the subtitle is What's Become of the Common Good. It seems to me that the emphasis on merit and deserving that predominates in the moral and political culture these days is actually deeply antithetical to a notion of the common good. And the reason is this, during the period of globalization over the past four decades, roughly speaking, inequality has increased. Almost all of the gains of globalization over the past four decades have gone to those at the top. The average worker has basically uh, faced wag, uh, wage stagnation during this period. Now, morally, that's a shocking thing. Economically, maybe not so surprising. But what's most insidious about this development is not just the fact of the inequality, the growing gap between say the top 
and everybody else. What's most insidious is the sense of desert or merit that goes with it. Because essentially the public philosophy by which we've been living says, provided there's truly equal opportunity for everyone, an equal chance to get ahead, then those who land on top can believe that their success is their own doing and that they therefore deserve the fruits that go, the bounty that's bestowed on their success. And if that's true by implication, those who don't land on top, those who struggle must deserve their fate as well. So this is what seems to me to be a kind of tyranny of merit. It's the winners inhaling too deeply of their own success. The tendency of those on top to believe it's our own doing, this success. And, and by implication, everybody else, including those left behind, must deserve their fate as well. So in many ways, we're suffering from the tyranny of merit, the conviction, the hubris, I would say the meritocratic hubris of the winners believing that their success is their own doing. So I think really to get to a politics of the common good and to a, to a moral conception of solidarity, we have to take on at the fundamental level, the question of merit and desert that has prevailed in, in the last several decades but whose moral and theological origins go all the way back to the Deuteronomic picture that Rabbi Held was describing, the idea that people get what they deserve. There's a humility in questioning that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that, that the, the solidarity we need depends on recovering a certain sense of humility and maybe of mystery to go back to the theological question a certain mystery about how God, how the cosmos dispenses success and failure, happiness and suffering. But what, what do you think, Shai? Yeah, I, so I think I wanna to try to back into an answer by starting with what Jamie ended with, um, the question of who deserves our sympathy. So I, I, I wanna kind of come at this from a somewhere between a spiritual, emotional and ethical lens. You know, one of the things that we are faced with now um, is a really profound sense of our fragility and vulnerability. And vulnerability, I think, is a kind of double-edged sword. Feeling vulnerable on the one hand can lead us to close ourselves off, to wrap ourselves around the people closest to us and essentially ignore everyone else because after all, we're afraid. But vulnerability, embracing our vulnerability can also be an extraordinary road to a deeper sense of compassion for others. Um, because at the end of the day, as much as some of us work hard to deny this, vulnerability is simply endemic to the human condition and is unavoidable. It's not to say that we are all equally vulnerable in various social ways, but we are all vulnerable flesh and blood. And what that makes possible, I'll just say this maybe in, a, in an ethical lens first, the acceptance of our of vulnerability allows us to grow in compassion rather than pity. Pity is essentially driven by the illusion that I am superior to you and so what has happened to you could never happen to me. Compassion is all about a shared sense of humanity and what happened to you could have happened to me because we're both human. And a society with a robust conception of the common good, with a robust commitment to solidarity is a society built on compassion rather than pity. To use another image that I, I personally find helpful in this way, Pity is fundamentally a vertical posture, whereas compassion is horizontal. When I pity someone, I fundamentally look down at them from a place that I imagine is above them. When I have compassion for someone, I reach across to them, recognizing that we operate very much um, you know, on the same plane. 
And, you know, I think something like a pandemic reminds us of the, or ought to remind us, I should say, ought to remind us of the relativity of all of the social hierarchies that we live with. At the end of the day, we are all humans, infinitely valuable because created by God in a theological language, and also incredibly fragile because we're only flesh and blood. And what I would hope would be an opportunity we would take amidst all this darkness is to allow our, our vulnerability to expand our sense of who is included in our compassion. Um, and here I want to suggest, you know, that that's a very much a biblical mandate, right? You know, all over the ancient world, there is a commitment, um, at least a theoretical commitment, to protecting the widows and the orphans. And one of the Bible's great moral revolutions is expanding the category of widow and orphan to include the stranger, to include the person who is not part of the covenant community um, or not fully part of the covenant community. And what that means is that the Bible's claim is that we are not only responsible for those who are our vulnerable, but rather for those who are the vulnerable. We are responsible for those who are vulnerable to our own power. Um, and that I think would be an enormous moral leap if we could begin to move in that direction as a result of really confronting head on um, where we are in this moment. Uh, regarding the question, excuse me, of merit and dessert, I mean, I, I don't have so much to add to Michael's comment. I, I will just say here that here again, to speak in a, in a biblical idiom, Deuteronomy is obsessed with a fear, which is God effectively says to the Israelites, I am going to shower you with blessing. But you know what the danger of that is? Blessings are always also temptations. And you will decide that you did it all for yourself, that it's all about you, and you don't owe anybody anything. You don't owe me anything, and you don't know the weaker members of your society anything. And that will be a crime, and my blessing will have turned into curse. I think one of the problems in our culture is that success, quote unquote, has become precisely that kind of curse. I, I remember once sitting in a class, I was teaching to a group of um, businessmen and hedge fund managers. And when I said something about how um, many of them were where they were to a very significant degree, simply because of luck, one of them sort of, you know, very emphatically protested, do you have any idea how hard I've worked? And because I had made this commitment to myself that I was never gonna to speak to donors differently than I spoke to anybody else. I said, you know, first of all, no, I don't know how hard you've worked, but I do have a question for you. Who do you think works harder on a given day? You or the guy who smears the cream cheese on your bagel in the coffee shop? I invite you to look me in the face and tell me you work harder. And if you can't do that, then we have to have a different kind of conversation about what it means to earn the things we have. You inherited your father's business. <laughs> right? He started with nothing. So what kind of solidarity could we have that you say, in other words, how can you have, let, let me maybe say this, a society that convinces itself that everyone has what they have because of merit is a society that will end up radically devoid of compassion. Hmm. Because after all, if you don't have what I have, it's your own fault. As opposed to circumstances are hard in life. Some of us get lucky and some of us don't. Um, some of us have circumstances, right, that benefit us, and some of us have had circumstances that militate against our success in all kinds of ways. So the two questions, I think, are deeply entwined with one another, you know, lessening, the, weakening the hold of our almost idolatrous preoccupation with the discourse of, of, of merit, which is in any case, much of the time, false and an illusion, and expanding and buttressing our commitment to society built on compassion. That would be a society that would be worth re-entering. Um, you know, in a whole new way. Okay. Should we see, Jamie, whether some of the participants would like to, to jump in? We, we are receiving them um, through a phone. So a combination of some of the questions, uh, these will be our closing questions for now, um, look something like, for the folks who are on this call, as they leave this call and head, head out in their social networks to be able to decide how to build this common society or this place where we actually pay attention to those who are vulnerable to our power, as you were describing Rabbi Held. Where do they begin to 
direct their resources? How do they begin to decide again um, where they volunteer and which causes they would dedicate their time to? How is it they begin that effort when they leave this call? Shai? Um, yeah, interesting and really hard question. I guess I, I want to. I guess I want to begin by saying that I think in the short term, in the very immediate term, what we need is a commitment to an awful lot of band-aids. There are a lot of people, most of whom are not on this call, who are facing kind of, as Professor Sandel suggested earlier, a kind of crisis that is different than the crisis that many of the people on this call are facing. Um, you know, one of the most powerful experiences I've had teaching in the last couple of years and traveling was um, an evening I spent in a small mill town in Maine um, in which the entire room basically said, you know, if we had an unexpected medical bill, we would basically file for bankruptcy. We have nothing. Um, it was enormously, enormously powerful. And, and also, by the way, tragic as a statement of America, when I ask them, um, what do you think this country could do to help you? Most of them said, and I didn't know if it was because Bernie Sanders had been there, most of them said, well, we could have um, the government pay for our health insurance. And then a few of them said in ways that were heartbreaking, well, we could reopen the mills because we haven't had jobs in 30 years. Um, it was just enormously, enormously painful. But I, I, I think in the, sh in the very short term, we need Band-Aids for the people who are going to be in very immediate crisis, not having enough food to feed their kids, not having enough to, to take care of their, of their most urgent medical needs. But at the end of the day, Band-Aids are not going to be what heals the society. So while we, you know, while we commit to the Band-Aids, we also have to ask the questions about how we can build a society that if, God forbid, we ever face another moment like this, there aren't this number of people who are desperate for the largesse of the people on this phone call, right? How do we create a society where certain basic um, survival um, needs are met? the elemental needs for food, clothing, and shelter. You know, what do we do to create? By the way, we say the Yom Kippur Haftarah, right, is about, you know, what is the society that God wants? I want a society in which the elemental needs of food, shelter, and clothing are available to all. We, not only do we not have that kind of society, we, you know, have from a theological and ethical perspective, you know, are guilty of a kind of... a. a a society that is an abomination in that way, in terms of the, the amount of money we have in the society and the amount of poverty and suffering um, that, we, that we live with. On a more interpersonal level, I would say, you know, when people try to find the place where they can serve, um, you know, the Protestant theologian and novelist Frederick Beekner has this wonderful line somewhere. He says, um, I think, I, if I remember this correctly, he says, vocation is the place where the world's deep need, the world's deep need meets the heart's deep hunger. Um, I think there is so much brokenness in our society that when it comes to people's commitment to serve, we all have this kind of negotiation between where is the greatest need and where can I bring something that, um, you know, makes use of what I uniquely perhaps can bring. Um, I guess I would also say, following um, my allusion to the Haftarah for Yom Kippur, is that what it takes, what it will take from all of us is a commitment both to compassion and to justice, right? Isaiah talks about casting off the yokes of injustice, the yoke of injustice, and about inviting the poor into our home. So a more just society, but also a more caring society. It is, it, I, I find often that the people I teach the, who care about the world, they are often what I would call justice Jews and compassion Jews. The compassion Jews just want to, and God bless them, just want to work you know, in homeless shelters and soup kitchens. And the justice Jews want to scoff at those people and think it's only about social policy. And the truth is, it is deeply and I think irrevocably, irreducibly about both of those things. It is about society that cares more and a society um, that is more just. You can't really tease those apart. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll maybe close by saying, I think for those of us who, are, who spend our time now admiring nurses, 
Um, this would also be an incredible moment to have a conversation as a society about the ways that we broadcast our disdain for care, right? Those are jobs that don't pay anything. Um, the, the, uh, forgive me for one more minute. I'll just mention the, the feminist philosopher Nell Noddings has this wonderful observation she made 20 years ago, and it's still true. She says, you know what feminism accomplished? It allowed women to pursue professions that were, um, that were traditionally male. But what it didn't do at all was come to value professions that were traditionally female, such that men can see themselves as respectable when they do them. I would like to live in a society where men can say, when I grow up, I want to be a social worker. I want to be a school teacher because caring is what it means to be a human being. By the way, caring is what it means to be a Jew in the world. I want to care for God's creation. I want to care for God's creatures. This is a moment when we might radically reevaluate how we value what people do with their life, what we reward. If you never appreciated your kids' teachers, try having them at home with you all day, every day, right? <laughs> No, really, it's it's extraordinary, and you know, and we need to fundamentally reimagine how we value care, education, you know, the roles in our society that are about um, facilitating and fomenting the growth of those who are most vulnerable. Right. I I don't have a lot to add to that. I'm very sympathetic to what. Shai has said, I, I would simply say, maybe this is really just to restate maybe uh, Shai, what you've said, that we have to operate on, a, a channel our, our concern and our care on two tracks at once. Sadaka is very important, but so is transforming the society and in particular the economy that governs our lives during moments of crisis and ordinary times. And I, I think both of those kinds of work and commitment uh, need to take place together. Thank you both so much for your time and for your wisdom and for joining us together. In this instance of, of solidarity, we have a, a crowd of 278 people for whom having this conversation about morality and coronavirus with how they wanted to spend their evening. And I'm sure that we have hundreds of others who are joining us on Facebook Live. So to all of you who are joining us here tonight, thank you for choosing to think with your heart about what it means to rebuild a society based on solidarity and what it means for you in this particular moment to live into that. So thank you for joining us, Rabbi Held, Professor Sandel, you've offered inspiring and very challenging comments for all of us. Um, and may we continue these conversations as a means of overcoming the forces that tell us that we should not be in solidarity or we should be distant. May we safely continue feeling connected to these challenging questions and sources of hope that we've all shared this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. you may not be able to hear, but there is actually rousing applause. Hard to convey that uh, via Zoom. Uh, but I want to echo Jamie's gratitude uh, to Professor Sandel and Rabbi Held, and also uh, my gratitude to Jamie for so beautifully uh, steering this conversation. Uh, very quick, this is the first, as I mentioned, in a series of sessions that Harvard Hill is hosting on coronavirus. The next will be this coming Monday uh, from 7 to 8 p.m. with Professor Noah Feldman on the topic, Leaven and Infection, Reflections on Passover in the Time of Corona. Uh, one other event, perhaps slightly lighter, is coming up this Sunday. They're all welcome to join. That's at 6 p.m. Uh, with Alicia, Alyssa Joe Robbins, uh, Girls in Trouble in a World in Trouble, Concert and Conversation. Uh, Ms. Robbins is an award-winning poet and musician. Uh, Girls in Trouble, inspired by the women of our scriptures, spans and merges musical genres. A conversation with Alyssa for the Harvard Hill community will follow. Uh, both those events are up on our Facebook page, so take a look there. And once again, thank you again to Professor Sandel and Rabbi Held and to Jamie, and I wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you, Dr. Thank you.